I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the manager of Raymond Van Barneveld and the co-owner of Ultimate Darts Cars, Jacko Van Bodegom. Jacko, thanks for the time. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, guys. Good morning. Now, we'll come on to your work with Ultimate Darts Cars in a few minutes, but first I wanted to talk about your role as manager of Raymond. Before becoming his manager, you organised some sponsorship for Roland Shelton, but was working with Roland your first taste of working in darts? Yes, yes. I was working in a lot of other sports, and then I got... uh... Uh, called by a friend of mine, Jan Vaas, who is uh, a famous snooker referee. And he said, uh, I'm friends with Roland Scholter and he's always finding difficulty uh, getting sponsors. Could you help him out? I said, no, no, I'm not into darts and uh, things like that. And then he kept pushing a little bit and said, why uh, why don't you uh, take him to a tennis tournament once and you can meet up there and you can talk to him because he's a really nice guy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's what I did. He was a really nice guy. And then I found two big sponsors for him. Problem was he was already at the end of his career, unfortunately, due to uh, several injuries. And then when I visited the tournament with him, yeah, like other players came to me to ask me if I could do the same for them. Uh, one of them was Raymond and his manager, but I said no to them because um, my initial work was in tennis and in football. So, but I kept in touch with Raymond over the years and uh, sometimes uh, we had contact and he asked me several times to work with him and for him, but I always said no until... Five and a half years ago, I promised myself to take a sabbatical and uh, he asked me to join him to a couple of Premier League games because he said, yeah, but I think you're going to like it. We have the same humor and we love shopping and food. And that was all correct. So we did. I uh, I went with him to, I think it was the final night of the Premier League then before the cutoff, you know, and uh, he was after the cutoff, he was number last and then we started working together. You mentioned uh, a couple other sports there in your, in your other business interests. Had, had you worked in any other sports or with other sports people or was the darts something completely new for you with that? Uh, well, at the moment, I, I've, I've been working a lot in sports, in football and, and tennis and uh, yeah, also snooker, boxing. There are so many things I've done over the over the years. You build a big network. But tennis and football were my biggest, uh, my biggest markets. Now I almost solely do the darts, but I'm also um, involved in a project with uh, with the guys from Vantage, they uh, they train uh, certain skills for football players f- from the biggest stars until uh, let's say the biggest talents of uh, a lot of clubs also in the UK, uh, Manchester United, I think Manchester City, Liverpool, but also Barcelona, Real Madrid. So that's really cool to work with. And then uh, yeah, we started uh, Ultimate Dart Cars. And so the, the point where you become Raymond's manager, he's still one of the, the top players in darts, 2015, 2016, 2017, three consecutive World Championship semifinals, a, a Premier League regular. What was it like those early days being Raymond's manager? Yeah, you know, in the early days, it was easier because Raymond was very accessible. So he, he, when I had some ideas about mental things, mental aspects of his game and, and his work ethics, he was really, really listening. And not like, not that I knew anything about darts because I'm not a darts player, but I thought his mentality of the game had to change because he was always, you know, shaking his head and things like that. And I said, listen, when you shake your head, your opponent sees that. And you also do it when you're trino up. So that gives them hope. And you, you never want to give somebody a window of opportunity because they think, hey, wait, he's struggling as well. So let me get in there. And in the, in the beginning, like the first year in the Premier League, he was, like I said, he was number last. So the next morning, we sat uh, in the hotel uh, uh, eating breakfast. I said to him, okay, just for, for my point of view, yeah, what are you going to do the next eight weeks or seven weeks? Who are you going to beat? Who are you going to lose to for sure? And where's the opportunity? Where's still a chance? He said, what are you talking about? I can beat anybody. Oh, I said, okay, I don't know that. It's like in football. You're not going to win against Ajax when you're a lower team, right? You're number lost. So I think you're going to, normally, I think you're going to lose to the bigger players. And then he said, you're, you're crazy. I can win against everybody. So I said, okay, so now we're going to do week after week, just play one match at a time. And the funny thing is he didn't lose a match anymore. He played a draw on the final night against Stephen Bunting. That uh, cost him the number three spot, I think. So now he had to play the semifinals against Michael van Gerwen. I think he was 5-1 and 8-5 up and he still lost. But yeah, that was, you know, the time where he really listened. But Ray was always struggling, you know. He wanted to play less because it got to him all the traveling and all the being away from home. There were just, for him, too much tournaments. He was also struggling with his diabetes. And, uh, yeah, that went down every year. It went down that you're ready to do everything you need to do to be one of the best players. His biggest problem is his talent is too much. 
he has too much talent. So it's too easy for him. Like we did a match against Phil Taylor. He didn't play for two weeks. And all of a sudden, he's playing great. You know, you can't explain that. And that's, I think that's his biggest concern. And the last two years, yeah, it was just, there were so many troubles at home. And uh, it's really difficult to get a focus then. And uh, we thought by announcing his last year that for him it would calm him down and, uh, you know, see that, okay, this is going to be my final year. I have the opportunity to say goodbye to all my fans. He could enjoy that. But it, it worked the other way around. It gave him so much pressure to perform every single night because he doesn't want to let his fans down, his countrymen down, the PDC down, his sponsors down. So instead of being a relief, it went from being kind of a hell in his mind. And we couldn't get him to settle down. He was just over-practicing, over-focusing. And the only thing, that, or everything could go wrong, and they went wrong. You know, losing two times in a row the first round of the World Championship, that's for him the, the biggest the biggest thing that could happen to you, but in the negative side. And the first three years, like you said, it was amazing. I mean, I had my point of view so where I thought it was uh, not the smartest things to do, you know, he was busy with finals when we're, we had to play semifinals. He was busy with arranging tickets for family and friends while you're still in a, in a tournament, you know. You need to go to bed, rest, etc., etc. But that's also enthusiasm. I understand that because he wasn't winning that much anymore. And that's, I think, the biggest difference between other sports. You can play darts until you're 60, but your body isn't 30 anymore. And just um, really looking back at... Raymond's final year one of the, the big stories in darts was that it was going to be his final year and just want to talk to you about the the Premier League in, in Rotterdam he, he lost a couple of games there and announced his immediate retirement before going back and saying that he's going to continue until the world championship just what was that week like being around Raymond and, and seeing all that unfold yeah I, I think I can talk about that now it wasn't appropriate talking about then but you know he was in a divorce and I'm not going to say anything about his wife because I love her she's really wonderful but there were so many things going on in that week that it was so extremely difficult for him to focus on his matches, you know, and, and he had to win two times. Otherwise, you know, you're out of it. And the pressure was really big on him. He wanted to perform the final time in Ahoy, which obviously meant a lot because the years before that, it was just an amazing atmosphere. He also played really well there. But the first night he forgot about there was a little draft in Ahoy all those years. And he was he started playing with a lighter uh, dart. Uh, I think 21 grams uh, instead of the 25. So when he started the match, uh, all of a sudden he had no control. And the funny thing is the other player with a light dart uh, there was Peter Wright. And he was also struggling a lot that night. So he lost that match and then he was already relegated against Daryl Gurney. And the next day he had to play Michael van Gerben. That obviously is harsh uh, when you're not uh, playing well, when you just had a big disappointment. And then that morning there was a bit of a incident with uh, at home uh, to be a little bit not too specific and that 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 lost it for him uh, you know and then um, uh, we had to go uh, back to the practice board to practice with the 25 grams then he had to play that same night his uh, grandchild was there for the first time in darts he gave him his barney necklace he was all emotional about what happened at home and his grandchild being there the final time in ahoy and you're playing michael van gerber so it's so difficult but i think after the match for the first time, we had a big argument because he didn't want to do an interview anymore uh, or go back on stage. And uh, But he did. And it, I think it went pretty well. Then he had to go back for interviews uh, and the press conference. And then he was in an interview with RTL7, with Arjen van der Giesen. And there was, for me, there was nothing wrong. I was talking to Michael and to, uh, to another guy, uh, a visitor. And uh, all of a sudden, um, I heard uh, Arjen van der Giesen storm out to... Uh, Michael van Gerwen, he said, yeah, Raymond's going to retire. What's your reaction? So Michael looked at me. I said, never, right? I said, never. Yeah, yeah, he just told us he's going to retire. It's immediate, in, with immediate effect and he's blah, blah, blah. I said, Arjen, listen, you know how he is after you lost a match. He's always that negative. No, no, but he said it this time. And so I thought, what's going on, you know? So I followed Raymond and he was doing an interview, I think, with Sky at the moment or, or the PDC before going to the press conference. So I put my arms around him and said, what's going on? And he said, Jaco, I can't take the pain anymore. I can't do this. I said, listen, Raymond, if you want to retire, you retire, but don't make a decision like that in the heat of the night. You know, in the heat of the moment, you're so negative now. You can't think straight. You know that for the 30 years you're doing this job. I said, just 
do your press conference. We go back to the hotel. We talk in the morning and see what you feel like then. Obviously, that didn't help. So uh, he again announced it there and he was talking about all the pain, which I obviously understand. So then I went back to the hotel. He went back to his home, not to his hotel. Uh, we spoke for two and a half, three hours on the phone. Uh, he was already regretting his uh, decision, but he was still struggling. I said, listen, tomorrow morning he was going to go to Paris and uh, just have a good weekend and, and let's talk. And then I saw the interview back he had with RTL7 because that came online. And in the interview, there was nothing wrong. He wasn't saying he was going to retire. He was just, while leaving the scene, while he did the interview, he said to Arjen, uh, a small comment, I don't know how much longer I can take this. So Arjen said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, the pain. I'm struggling with the pain. And then Arjen said, so do you mean you're going to retire? Yeah, maybe I, I would. You know, And that's how that conversation went on. If he just walked out of the room and Arjen did him, didn't get him back he was never going to tell he was going to retire so i was a little bit upset with Arjen at that time obviously he's a journalist so they're also always looking for news but you know that made it also so extremely difficult because everybody in the darts world know how difficult it is for these players after they lost a match to not to be too brutally honest you know and i think uh, you need to protect those players as well and i think Arjen failed there a little bit and nothing negative of Arjen because he's, he's an amazing, nice guy, did a lot of good for Dars, also for Raymond, but this was just, I think, a big mistake. So when I started the interview, I called Raymond back and we talked about it more. And then I said, listen, Ray, if you want to retire, that's what you do. But I have to act now because the PDC has to put out a message, blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, you know, you know, I don't want to retire. You know, I want to do perform really well, but it's getting to me, you know, the, the pressure and, and the pain. So, um, I said, okay, then reverse your decision, you know, if you don't want to retire, because it, this is not how you want to end to end a career of 35 years. Your goal was to play one more world championship after the disaster, disaster of last year. Then do that, because otherwise you got to sit on the couch for the next three years, feeling sorry for yourself. Why the hell you announced your retirement after a last match where you were already relegated just because you feel you were humiliated, you know? And then he said I was right, but he still wanted to talk, uh, think about it. So he said, okay, tell the PDC, tell the media, uh, I regret my decision, etc. And then on Monday, we'll speak later when he comes back from Paris. Now, we did. And, uh, and obviously, I, I, I heard a lot in the, in, the, on, in the darting community that it was me that made him go uh, on with darts. Otherwise, I couldn't make money. With all due respect, I, can't, I get nothing from his prize money. So there's nothing in it for me. You know, I just wanted his last year to be... A good year for him, you know, and not go out on a down like this. In the end, it didn't work. And sometimes he said to me, maybe I should have retired after that night. But I think that's not how it works. It's for everything. There's a reason, you know, and like the world championship, maybe that's your next question. Losing first round there again. We obviously said to each other before that world championship, because we were in the airport, London City Airport, waiting uh, for our flight when the draw was being done. And I said to him. Listen, it doesn't matter who you're going to draw, because no matter who you get, even if you get me, the first round is going to be the most difficult match for two reasons. Last year, you lost your first match, and this is your final world championship. So if you win your first match, everything is possible. And Peter Wright proved that he should have gone or could have gone out first round, and he became world champion. And that's, that's what I love about the darts, uh, the mental aspect of that game, and that one day you're the best player in the world, averaging whatever, 115, and the next day you throw 82 and you look in the mirror and you think, how can I do this for a living? That's that's what I love about it. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, talking about the World Championship. Obviously, the, the build-up going into it with it being Raymond's last tournament, he had a, a great run at Minehead getting to the quarterfinals and we saw him practicing with, with Phil Taylor as well. So a lot of darts fans were hoping to see Raymond perhaps have a, a big run at Ali Pali in December, but unfortunately he went out in his first game. How tough was it to pick him up after that as we saw just how disappointed he was in his interview with Sky afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I've talked to the PDC a lot about these things and I understand, you know, but normally during the whole year, a player who loses doesn't get an interview with Sky or on TV. Only RTL7 wants that, you know, and, and that's, I understand that, but they know the players are so vulnerable and obviously they say, oh, okay, a player can also say just normal things, but Raymond is not one of those players. He wears his Hard on his tongue, you say, I think, over on his sleeve. He 
talks, everything. It goes out without a filter. Bam, bam, bam. Everything it feels at that moment, it's coming out. And he is in, I've seen him in very, very dark places. But after that loss, and, and I felt the same, obviously, because Darren Young is a great guy. But he didn't need to lose against him, you know. And, and there was a lot of opportunity because he was playing really, really well. He, he played an exhibition against Simon Whitlock a couple of days before. He played extremely well. But like I said, the first round, the pressure, it's so difficult. And yeah, afterwards, yeah. We, we were, after that interview with Sky, we, I had to make him do RTL7 as well. Because you want to go out with your, your nose up, right? Your chin up. And then the German TV but for the German TV, he couldn't he couldn't even speak. He was just standing there in shock. And I think he, he, he stayed in the UK with his girlfriend. I stayed with him for a couple of days to look after him because I was really worrying. I got so many texts and calls from people that were re- really worrying for him, you know, as a person. And I think it took him weeks to get his feet back and, you know, to see a little bit of the positive side. But I think he felt a little bit better after his big farewell in Holland in February. But before that, he felt, uh, yeah, really bad, really negative. Everything that we were hoping for, for the last year, didn't happen. And yet, like you said, the quarterfinal, that was also a big opportunity because he lost that quarterfinal because he panicked just before the match. All of a sudden, he was playing three great matches the day before. And I think he was playing Chris Doby, right? Yeah, Chris Doby quarterfinal. And just before the start of that match, he, he panicked. And that was... Uh, yeah, difficult. And you saw that it was completely out of sorts, Raymond van Barneveld in that quarterfinal. And I think it was 10-2 or something. One more on, on Raymond then, but then we'll get on to the, the ultimate darts cards. The early part of this year, and you touched on it there, we saw in February a, a big exhibition in Amsterdam to celebrate Raymond's career. It looked like a, a great night. But before we all went into lockdown, what had this year been like with all the exhibitions? I'm sure the demand must have been high for people wanting to see him in action. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, this year was Big in exhibitions all over the world. We were going to do Australia as well. And uh, lots of things. Yeah, the, the, the night in Amsterdam, that was the most perfect night. You know, I mean, you get lived by every single minute. So it's really difficult to enjoy for him as well. Because you do this, do that, do this. But there were so many great dark players. There were so many great celebrities. The vibe was fantastic. The music was great. He got on it in so many ways. He got his own coin that made him a career a career prize award, uh, a golden dartboard. There were so many things they did for him. And I think, yeah, I think that was the perfect night for him. It really was the only disappointment he had that it couldn't be broadcasted on TV because you want to show that to all your fans. But yeah, that's that's the rules. <laughs> Let's switch gears to the ultimate darts cast then. We've seen a lot of pictures doing the rounds on, on social media the last few weeks. It seems to be attracting a, a lot of attention. Firstly, where did the idea come from? Yeah, that's a funny story. Uh, like a couple of months ago, I saw an ad on Instagram doing uh, an ultimate card, but then for the game FIFA. And, and my two uh, godchildren, they play soccer. So I thought to myself, hey, how great is it to, to make some uh, design one for them? So I did. And, and three days later, I received it, gave it to them, and they were so happy with them. And then one of them said, Jaco, can you put it on Instagram so we will we'll be famous and they're four and six year old. Mm-hmm. So I thought, uh, okay, okay, I do that. So I tag a couple of football players and know and I tag the, the company who made it. And then that guy responded to me exactly at the time he responded to me. I thought to myself, how cool would this be in darts? Because I think the darts merchandise, you know, can have, have a little injection, a, a little bit. Uh, it's, it's always the same, you know, and, and there needs to be something new. And this is something that's, you can only see as positive. It can make you proud. Everybody identifies it with the ultimate cards of FIFA. So I thought, how cool would it be? So I approached the guy who, uh, who who made them in football and I said, listen, I have an idea to do this in darts. I have, I think, a great opportunity because I know all the players. And uh, let me talk to Raymond and Phil. And then I talked to Michael as well. And everybody was really uh, enthusiastic about it. And we designed for Phil and Raymond two examples. And we showed them at Raymond's farewell night. People were going mad when they saw them. They wanted to have them. And then we thought, okay, let's do this in darts. And ultimately, create the create your own version was for us the most important thing because then everybody can have his own ultimate card. But more and more players approached me that they wanted to have their own card. So you talk to either their manager or their dart brand. And we have a lot of players coming. Yeah, but we want to reveal them, not everybody at the same time, because we want to grow uh, little by little and not put 100 players out there at once, you know. Yeah, definitely. And some, some big names uh, on board early on. You mentioned there, Raymond, Michael, Phil, and more following every week, it seems. How, how pleased have you been with the interest from darts players and, and fans so far? 
Yeah, extremely pleased, obviously, you know, we're, we're, because of the corona, the initial idea was we were going to do the, the big ones and the, and the medium ones and the big ones also signed by players, because I know in the darting world that means a lot for people to have uh, uh, the players, uh, their heroes, put their signatures on there. But due to the corona, it was very difficult. We could only do that with Raymond and, uh, and Michael, because they live in Holland, just like me. So then I spoke to uh, Daniel, the other guy I do this with, and I said, listen, I think it's great if we also create the small card but we give them exclusively to players we give all the players 100 they can sign and send them themselves that way they can make some extra money during these difficult times when they can't play matches and as soon as the borders go open again and corona settles down a little bit we can continue with all the players selling the signed cards as well but then in the meanwhile they have made some money and you know it's a win-win for everybody, I think. And that's what we did. And a lot of players really appreciated that and saw the opportunity and took the opportunity, obviously. And that goes well as well. So, yeah, I think it works out for everybody now. And uh, we're happy. We're really happy. And, uh, yeah, like y- yesterday, th- we started the Create Own. We launched that. And then we saw Jermaine Watimena and Ricky Evans creating their own card. For me, that's funny, you know, because they can contact me and they can get their own card if they're manager of or, or a sponsor approve, obviously, but I think it's the biggest compliment you can get that a, a world star player wants to create his own card, you know? Yeah, it's really nice and great to see that that option come available for players and, and also fans as well, create their own cards. How excited are you to, to introduce that option? Yeah, really excited because I know from him that in football it works really, really well and he is just doing it in Holland. He's now going to roll it out together with Gregory van der Wiel all over the world they're going to do those ultimate football cards and uh, but we started immediately all over the world for the darting community and yeah you it's it's just you know it's just nice we get since the start i've been getting i think 20 30 messages a day when people can create their own cards you know and we obviously knew right away that we were going to do that but we want to grow our community first have more players on board which we knew they were but yeah, like i said we want to introduce one or two players a week but it was just great. And then when you see it finally happening last night, then you see it was so busy on our website. Constantly people were creating their own cards. And, and, and this morning it just went on, you know, and that's, yeah, it's great to see. Let's see what, how it goes from here. Well, we, we are going to do other sports, but uh, also, but I mean, in the darts, I think it's really nice. Definitely. Darts is, is keeping you busy managing Raymond and this new venture with Ultimate Darts Cards, but the conveyor belt of, of Dutch talent coming through is, is never ending. Would you maybe be interested in managing other players down the line? I have been uh, asked a couple of times the last year by big players, but also uh, less big players, if I could manage them or could do something with them. And the difficult thing is I am a curious guy. <laughs> For me, the the, the biggest aspect of darts, because I think all these players can play great darts, but only some of them have the mentality and the, the strength in mentality to, you know, be the best, like a Michael Van Gerwen, like a Gerwen Price, because some of them are really, really good mentally wise, and some of them uh, not. And they are great, they are great players, but these players could get some extra attention and work one-on-one with somebody to get the best out of their career. And one of the best examples was one of the guys that was in Raymond's team, Jeffrey Deswan. And I, I helped him out a little bit and, and talked to him several times, but he really needed one-on-one, you know. And then when his manager, Ben de Kok, and when he introduced him to Iwe Kuytert and, and Jeffrey worked one-on-one with him, that's when he took off, you know. That when That's when he was playing really, really well. And I'm not going to name names because I don't want to offend people, but there are some really big talents out there that I think should work one-on-one with somebody not with me but with somebody who can take care of them but also the mental aspect of the game because they need to learn that it's not about one match I'll give you one example I see one player still not going to name his name he won a, 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 a last leg decider you know on the Pro Tours second round third round great match and he came off the board you know uh, high-fiving everybody who was happy for him and I said to him what are you doing you're playing a match, your next match in 15 minutes. Go back to your table, you know, have a drink, have, have a sandwich or whatever, and, and go back to the practice board and stay in focus, you know. And, and 20 minutes later, he lost the next match who he, he, he would have, should have won easily, and he lost 6-1. And then he walked out, no friends anymore, giving him high fives or, you know, being there for him. He was just all out on his own. And then I thought to myself, 
this is your problem, you know, you're so hyped winning one match, but with all the respect in a pro tour, that's nothing. You need to win seven in a day and you're only going to make a difference for your career if you get the sem- semifinals and further on. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a really, it's a really tough sport. I thought when I started with Raymond, I compare everything to tennis and football. I thought to myself, this is not the most difficult game, but darts is the most mental game I've ever seen. You, because there's no direct influence on your opponent, only the mental aspect. You see people stamping a little bit or clicking the darts or talking or, you know, just walking too close to you. And some of these guys are natural like that, like Gerwin Price and Michael van Gerwen. But there are also guys there who try to copycat. They're not like that. And then you see that on the hockey and that sets bad blood with other players and with fans and Yeah, I think it's intriguing. I think it's a wonderful game. I I said to Barry Earn one time when uh, Gurian Price got that big fine or he was going to get a big fine after that incident with, I think, Gary Anson, was it? I said to him, listen, I understand that people are going to fine him. I said, but with all due respect, uh, darts is only about superheroes and you need villains as well. And and I think uh, because every great movie makes out of these characters, right? And let Gurren Price be a villain because he is a great player. He's a fantastic guy, but he is who he is. He's not acting, you know, and that's if you see that you need to appreciate him more and, and let him do a little bit more because the rules are very, I think, are very unclear. Well, Jack, I really, really appreciate your time. If people want to check out Ultimate Darts, uh, you go to ultimate-darts.com, check him out on Twitter at Ultimate Darts. And yeah, great work that you're doing and really appreciate your time. And, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. All the best.